you guys today. I want to start off with the indication. This is an FDA cleared device um, for use in what's the yellow box down here. It's for patients with newly diagnosed malignant intracranial neoplasms and recurrent intracranial neoplasms. Um, what that means is, is best represented in the next slide, but we have a clearance across the spectrum here for adults. Um, we see the uses, and this again lines up with clearance. We see the uses primarily uh, as labeled here, sort of top to bottom on the left and, and in the green triangle. This doesn't mean that you can't have your own favorite. Uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering is primarily using this in metastases, University of Minnesota, primarily uh, gliomas, other places across the board. Um, but we see them in the reoccurrence setting, which was our first clearance, and then this January, we uh, received an updated clearance from the FDA for use in the upfront setting. Again, we have so many tools in, in some places and so few tools in others. It's kind of how you, how you see it. Um, but again, fully FDA cleared. FDA uh, um, product is cleared for intracranial use. It's, we have FDA cleared manufacturing, FDA cleared software. Uh, we've collaborated with the MIM for about two, two years now to uh, do that, and we can explain more, but there's a uh, most people who have an LDR brachytherapy program up and running have uh, sufficient software. If you let your, your software lapse or your program lapse or you haven't done this, we have freeware from us uh, through MIM, which is their MIM Symphony uh, tailored to our needs. Um, we have a clinical uh, code that it's DRG reimbursed through NS023, which is the highest reimbursing neurosurgical code for craniotomy, same as deep brain stimulators and, and gliadel. And then we have a lot of training materials. Me, he'll get into it, but we're um, over, I think at this point, 25 sites. So we've done this a lot of times so far and can help uh, smooth over any, any questions or concerns. And then we'll get into our um, clinical trial strategy. A quick, quick review as to why this is useful. Well, I think that uh, until we cure everyone on the upfront treatment and salvage everybody on the second, we're going to agree that we're not far enough. But there are some some huge, or at least medium-sized holes and needs in our current uh, platform of how we do things in radiation oncology and, and neuro-oncology. First of all, uh, we do have to wait in most instances to treat um, after resection. This was a woman with a brain metastasis, obviously a very nice resection. This was a radiation oncologist that recognized this as a gamma, day, gamma knife day film. There's pin positions here uh, giving a little artifact. A reoccurrence right where the neurosurgeons respect, uh, expect it to be because they come from a posterior entry, cannot really get good visualization. And here, this is like a J-hook tool. They, they don't have something that looks like a fish hook to resect with. And long story short, the frame came off and she went back to the OR. It's, it's the waiting. Um, we can use stereotaxy, of course. We can give this an extra dose, but this is occipital cortex. It's visual cortex. We, we hate to do that. Uh, the other is, is just where are we guessing? Again, all ROs on the call know that we are really good guessers, um, highly trained to do that, but this was a, a reoccurrent grade two meningioma uh, at the time of surgery or you know, immediately postoperatively. You know where that is, but they came back for a cyber knife treatment, and it's kind of hard to know where that's going to be. Um, this is really quite the same level. It's just that the internal structures have distorted so markedly. Uh, gamma tiles, you would probably lie across the sinus here and across the parenchymal edge, and, and you'd know. And then the other is, is dose distribution and dose intensity. Um, there is, uh, this is an occipital uh, reoccurrence of a high-grade glioma. This is the gamma tile zone. Um, because it's from the inside out, of course, it's high dose, and it's, it's short travel with the 30 keV sources. So Basically, this is a 10,000 rad uh, zone around the area of the operative bed. We mocked it up on a VMAT plan. Um, we capped this, I think it's a 6,536, because of course 10,000 people would think you're, you've lost your marbles. But the blue and the green are exactly the uh, same volumes, um, uh, same doses, uh, fourfold difference in volume. So it's, it's immediacy, it's accuracy, it's intensity. Um, and then just lower doses all the way around. Um, this has been tried before, brain brachytherapy. Um, still is used in some places. On the right is, is a picture from the Zeiss website of their intrabeam. Um, uh, it has pitfalls we can talk about, but simply it's a large mechanical device. You have to maneuver it in place. Uh, some brain mets are spherical, several, but they're not all superficial. They're 
uh, a 50 keV source there's that means in practice this is going to go two centimeters no matter what happens and in the brain there's a lot of things that are two centimeters away you don't want to get irradiated and it is single fraction um, if, if you think the radiobiology counts um, the other are seeds and, and some people do put this directly into brain parenchyma after maximum safe resection uh, some people put it on a stranded suture. I actually tried that uh, for a while and didn't like it, which is part of how we got to where we are today. Um, the problem with either of these is, is they're really quite um, uh, interesting technologies and, and techniques, but they require an artisan approach. They're not for everybody. And uh, in the case particularly of the seeds, um, you really have the problem of the inverse square law. You can either like it or hate it, uh, but it's the same as a charcoal grill or a light bulb. It's so much more intense right up against the seed. And what happens is you always have these micro hotspots um, that are able to cause necrosis. When you take a look at a recent uh, 10 years, which is recent in brain brachytherapy paper out of UCSF and Mike McDermott, who did his first case with this, frankly, last week in Miami after he moved down to be chair at uh, Miami um, Cancer Center. Uh, it took him under one minute to place this. Uh, typically, he's at 35 to 45 to do his technique. And, and the dose around these seeds are incredible. Um, there's a little debate about exactly how hot. Uh, you could measure accurately about a millimeter away. It's probably uh, 70,000 rads. Up against it, it's probably over 100,000. You always get an infarction from, from radiation necrosis. And then these are Mike was very happy with his paper and he published it. He says, you know, the, the seeds are between uh, eight and 10 millimeters apart, but we see four clumped together here. We see probably a big gap here. Here's five or six. So we wanted to get around that. We wanted to not use iodine with its long half-life, because frankly, with 60 days of half-life, people never get their dose. In brain tumors, we wanted to get around the long OR times, um, staph exposure and blowing a hole in neurosurgery schedules. And we wanted to go around the point of contact dose. So we basically designed this thing we showed you on the, the picture before. Uh, this is a schematic. I'm gonna quickly go to a, a piece with the original picture on it. So here's a tile. If you could see through it with your x-ray vision, uh, there's four cesium seeds inside of here, uh, equally spaced at 10 millimeters. Uh, they are within stranded suture to start with, which is how they get separated um, along the length. And then the, maintains the 10 millimeter interseed distance internally and five millimeters to the edge of each tile so that if you lay a second or third or fourth tile, you still have a 10 millimeter interseed distance. Uh, this material, and we'll show you a video, is, is very robust. And the point of it is, is simply enough, it maintains its shape after uh, insertion and it's offset three millimeters from the brain so that there's this um, internal compensator function uh, buffering the dose down to about um, uh, 10 to 12,000 rads at bed surface and 6,000 rads or 60 gray at five millimeters instead of the 70 to 100,000 gray uh, at, at the site, uh, 70 to 100,000 rads at the site of the seat itself. And they can be used upside down if need be, um, uh, still never contacting brain or, or vital structures, but giving it a localized increased dose if there's a little residual or another reason. Normally I'd say, hey, you got any questions, but uh, you can't do that. So I'm going to show you a quick video here. Um, this was a uh, case out of, I think, El Camino Hospital. Dr. Doty was good enough to share this. Um, the actual implant time, um, uh, we see the whole, we, we will see the whole implant. It's just uh, as if a, a hamster in a wheel was doing it. There's a blue dot placed on interoperatively. We often just place a little blue dot with a marking pen on the smooth side, which is the, the hot side, we want to put the cooler side toward the brain, and that way the surgeon keeps the dot in his uh, vision. And so that's what those are doing there. So here goes, uh, if I can find my play button. All right, he's putting the deep one. He's putting the side. I think this was about three, three and a half minutes. He's tucking these in place. He's going to end butt them. And then he used a half tile because they can be cut to line a cavity. So there's a deep tile, two are on the side and one here. You bring them up to the parenchyma of the brain um, just to keep them from, uh, just to keep the leptomeningeal rate down, which we've never seen, frankly. And then he complete his closure now. Um, this is a, uh, a little more slower video and I don't mean to bore anybody. 
but this was a long, thin uh, meningioma cavity. Um, the surgeon's just kind of preparing it. This again has clearance, a uh, pan histologic clearance. He's bringing a tile in and um, going to place one after another. I guess I could uh, find the sound here. For those of you who like the sound of suckers. And um, he'll take another tile. They're easy to handle. They don't fall apart. And he'll put it in similarly. Um, and most of our cases have been completed in under five minutes, many of them in under two, even by uh, you know, not uh, highly um, trained users in the sense that they're highly trained surgeons and radiation oncologists, but they are uh, new newbies. Um, we just finished, as I said, I think our hundredth case commercially recently. Um, you hear the, the, the beat of music in the OR. And so they're about to finish. He'll put in a couple more tiles and say, hey, I really like that. And that's, then the craniotomy gets concluded. And I'm going to turn this one off. Uh, they come in a shielded tray, just like this. Here's one being cut off. Here's a half a tile. We said you can use one. Gets handed to the surgeon and the tray gets slid shut. That's the existing or extent of the exposure in the OR. Um, I'm going to turn this one off now just because we're going to run out of time. So pre-commercial data. We, we didn't know this was going to work. We, uh, in fact, thought it wasn't because why would it? Brain tumor therapies newly minted don't typically work. So we started a trial at the Barrow Neurological Institute in 2013 in Phoenix. It opened in February of that year. It closed in February five years later. It was a single site observational trial of a, of a prototype device. The prototype device and the commercial device are essentially exactly the same other than they're made in a factory and then re-sterilized um, and shipped. Uh, they're identical seed um, strengths and uh, seed to uh, uh, surface area um, uh, ratios. We did 108 patients, uh, pardon me, 108 implants and 96 adult patients. And the uh, consort diagram um, looks like this, which is simply we consented 120 patients. Uh, we operated on 118. Two of them didn't go to the OR1 because of a rapid decline, and the other improved rapidly on steroids, and they'd been previously irradiated. 108 were implanted, and the delta of this 118 to 108 isn't a technical factor. They, despite everyone's uh, initial impression, radiology um, scans, everything else under the sun had only necrosis, got the right operation for necrosis, and had um, their uh, uh, necrosis removed. And then in the end, because it was a basket histology trial, basically we took anybody who had um, for the first several years, we only took recurrent and previously irradiated, but after a while, we uh, amended the trial, opened it up to no prior definitive same site treatment, meaning they could be people with brain mets previously treated elsewhere, but not at this site, reoccurrent meningiomas um, uh, elsewhere, but this is a new site, or in fact, a new or reoccurrent gliomas, uh, patients who maybe had a different hemisphere. Long story short, 52 glioma were uh, accrued, 35 meningioma, uh, 16 mets, and five others. We did publish our um, interim uh, meningioma analysis, uh, 20 consecutive previously irradiated and recurrent meningioma in the JNS. Came out in print form last December. We're updating it now. And I'm just going to share with you some of these updated data that are either uh, accepted or in press. Um, Basically, for the meningiomas, uh, let's concentrate on, on the tough group, which is the recurrent. Uh, we took 20, we had 29, excluding none, 29 previously uh, treated meningiomas. Um, the prior, all of these, again, were previously at the BNI, subsequently at the BNI. Occasionally, as the trial moved on, someone would come in from New Mexico, Colorado, or even Mexico City. Um, but most of these we had treated the first time. So we don't think that surgical or technical radiation skill improved massively to account for our results because they're time to recurrence from the prior treatment, which is what the blue bar is. These are the same groups. These aren't two separate cohorts. The blue is how long it took them to recur after the last treatment, typically radiation and surgery. Well, we had just over 24 months. And uh, of these um, 29, uh, five are grade three. Um, Two are grade one, 
however, they were uh, recurrent grade ones in patients with neurofibromatosis, and the, all the others are grade two, so essentially nasty patients. Um, we have not even hit the median time to recurrence, uh, and this is a recent update and um, accepted for presentation at the Congress of Neurological Surgeons uh, meeting this fall, which of course, like every other meeting, is going to be virtual this year. Um, very good outcomes, very low harms rate, and nobody required surgical repair of uh, a radiation or other injuries, um, and we'll be updating this data. And I, I have more slides as you can see, but we'll stick with this one for the moment. Um, recurrent GBMs. Uh, of our 40 reoccurrence, of our 52 total patients, 40 had previously been fully treated. Um, 28 were GBMs. Uh, the others, 11 were grade threes. One was a grade two. So let's concentrate on the 28 recurrent glioblastomas, 20 of which were first recurrence. Um, this was a salvage trial, obviously. This is like most salvage trials uh, at first, second, third, up to the fifth recurrence. Um, it turns out that uh, people, um, we did not in 2014 when we started specify subsequent therapies. Uh, people did receive BEV about 54% of the time afterwards, and then 46% of the time people didn't get BEV. Uh, Nature did us a solid here and, and created an experiment because BEV is, if not the standard of care, is, is clearly one of the most uh, current likely standard of cares. Um, our median OS, if you got BEV plus radiation, was, uh, uh, pardon me, for all comers was 10.7 months. If you got BEV plus radiation after gametial and resection uh, over 16 months, um, it was less for the BEV minus patients. Um, still, some did very well. This is a little skewed and, and I can dig deeper into it if you wish, because four people had early passing, uh, not from trial therapies. And they, of course, didn't live long enough to get BEV. If you uh, put those, if you take those aside, the, the BEV minus was six something months. So um, how that looks out in a graph is kind of like this. If you say, well, how did people do after tile plus uh, BEV? It's uh, just over 16 or 16 and a half months. If you kind of benchmark that against other current therapies that might be uh, tried, um, BEV alone in the recent NRG trial was 9.7 months. Uh, the blue bar to the left of that 10.1 is what BEV and EBRT, fractionated EBRT, were um, in the same trial, and it was considered negative. They pushed out the time to uh, PFS, but not OS. So that was a negative trial. BEV alone is still standing there. Resection is generally considered in here. This was a meta-analysis. I usually carry six months in my head, but seven is close enough. Optune from the 2012 strip trial that got Optune approved, about six and a half months and no treatment, the, the box comes, the data comes from um, the recent NRG uh, trial where they look at what happened on first reoccurrence if you've got. We're swimming in the same pond um, and this treatment with BEV, uh, with Optune, we can get into that a little bit and um, gives those pre-symptomatic or nearly symptomatic patients another bite of the apple so they can get back on uh, systemic therapies if, if that's an option for them um, before their disease uh, rolls right past them, as we know it all can, or all know it can. And then metastases, uh, it's the larger or recurrent metastases that get us all in trouble, particularly the large recurrent metastases. If you're up over uh, 20, 25 millimeters or greater, um, uh, that's where we kind of fail even with stereotaxy. And uh, it's possible that uh, fractionated is going to be useful or more useful for this. Um, that is, of course, the subject of the Alliance trial. Um, our data uh, is, is interesting, again, observational. We actually had only one failure uh, in the 16 people with greater than 20 millimeter um, lesions we treated. This was a gentleman with a body sarcoma. I think it was 34 millimeters. This is the day of gametile implant. And um, a year later, 10 months, he came back with four new brain metastases. One of them is shown in blue. This was his gamma knife day film. Uh, he had this area of localized persistence on the scan, and the team decided to irradiate it. Um, he died at 28 months of body systemic uh, sarcoma. Uh, this never became symptomatic, bigger or smaller. And simply enough, we called him a failure, but he is the only failure 
Um, so it was a Kaplan-Meier outcome at, at a year we had 83% uh, um, local control. These other data, this is from the Mahasian trial from MD Anderson from 2017. Um, the next two are over are Paul Brown's trial of uh, stereotaxy uh, and surgery or whole brain and surgery. Clearly whole brain um, has a little bit of an advantage uh, when you look at the numbers, but of course a, a market disadvantage on quality of life. Um, and I am going to uh, quit here showing you a picture. I came to San Francisco yesterday. This is midday Coit Tower. Um, street lights are on and uh, very strange. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mihi, I guess. Is that correct, Ashley? Yep, that's correct. Thank okay. you, David. Wow, yes, thank you. what a picture. That's Yeah, strange, very strange here. Strange times. And I should stop share because that's the way this works. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Brockman. All right, Mihi, we can't quite hear you. I think you're on mute. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, thanks. Okay, good. Um, sorry about that. Um, and now, part two, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, um, so I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes or so covering some of our post-commercial achievements. As you may be aware, Gamatil was FDA cleared for the treatment of recurrent intracranial neoplasms in July of 2018. And in January of this year, this was expanded to include newly diagnosed malignant intracranial neoplasms. Since the first commercial case in January of 2019, over 100 commercial cases have been performed at 24 centers, um, I think that's 26 now, um, across 12 states. Sorry about that. Our early adopting centers range from community practices in rural areas to large academic centers in major metropolitan areas. As you can see here, each center has its own comfort level for initial cases, be it gliomas, meningiomas, and or metastases, depending on their patient population and physician's experience. And Gamatel continues to expand with greater than 30 additional centers at various stages in the adoption process. So how are we doing? To find out, back in April, we performed a survey to gather feedback from users at early adopting institutions. At the time of the survey, 15 institutions had adopted Gamatil. The survey was opened on April 10th of 2020 and closed 10 days later. 16 neurosurgeons and 24 radiation oncologists from 14 institutions completed the survey, representing 51 of 52 commercial cases that had been performed to date. The neurosurgeons were asked questions about gametile-related complications, including wound infection, reoperation, and prolonged hospitalization rates. Radiation oncologists were specifically asked their opinion about the impact of gametile on caregiver burden. Both neurosurgeons and radiation oncologists were asked about the effect of gametile's one-and-done feature, assuring built-in patient compliance, as well as net promoter score questions, that is, how likely they were to use Gamatel moving forward and how likely they were to recommend it to colleagues. The responses were exceedingly favorable. Only one wound infection and one reoperation, the same case, were reported to be related to Gamatel for a rate of 1.9%. There were no prolonged hospitalizations due to tile placement and 100% and 96% of neurosurgeons and radiation oncologists respectively anticipated that the built-in compliance feature of Gamatel could improve patient outcomes. And 100% of radiation oncologists believe that caregiver burden was reduced with Gamatel. The net promoter scores were 79 for neurosurgeons and 42 for radiation oncologists. This is extremely positive for such a new medical technology and product. Only neurosurgeons with limited experience with the use of gametile, a single case scored less than nine on the net promoter score question. Similarly, respondees were in general highly likely to recommend gametile to a colleague. Those who scored lower in general had performed fewer cases. 
Outside of the survey, we continue to hear positive feedback. For example, a neurosurgeon commented that, Gametel is a last resort and a subset of patients who have recurrent disease in the face of prior external beam radiation or SRS. And a radiation oncologist stated that Gametile is the safest radiation for previously treated patients. Aggregating reports from public comments on 46 commercial cases treated across six institutions, radiation necrosis, wound healing complications, and local recurrence rates were low across the board relative to rates expected with repeat external beam. This is unpublished, but an encouraging indication nonetheless that off trial, physicians are seeing corroborative trends in safety and efficacy. We've also found that the fact that Yamatil offers a one and done treatment implanted at the time of surgery makes a world of a difference for patients with access to care challenges. One neurosurgeon offered the following comment regarding Yamatil. We live in a rural area with some locations having no access to radiation oncology. I think gametile is a great advantage to those patients. The same neurosurgeon goes on to share the story of a 76-year-old woman with an atypical meningioma who was ride dependent on a sister who worked full-time. She lived 90 minutes from the nearest radiation center, lived off of Social Security, and could not have completed a 30-fraction course of external beam radiation. Gametile was a perfect solution for her. She was implanted at the time of her third craniotomy and continues to do well at most recent follow-up. Based on this and similar reports from early users, we decided to take a closer look at access to care. We found a whole body of literature showing that patients who travel long distances to radiation centers and or rely on others for transportation for radiation have lower rates of compliance and thereby poor oncologic outcomes. We took it a step further and mapped out centers with SRS expertise and craniotomy expertise using 2018 CMS claims data. We found that there are 135 radiation centers in the US with brain tumor treatment expertise, meaning placing SRS claims in 2018. Correlating this with US population density data, nearly 200 million Americans live over half an hour from an SRS center, and over 50 million live over two hours from an SRS center. The breakdown by state and driving time is shown here. States with particularly high population percentages with extended drive time to radon centers are highlighted. In contrast, there are 530 or nearly four times more neurosurgical centers performing craniotomies. The contrasting availability relative to SRS centers is illustrated in the two maps. Any center performing a craniotomy can adopt gametile bringing brain radiation much closer to home for patients with access to care challenges. We continue to build on our clinical data. We're in the process of publishing the updated BNI trial results for meningiomas, brain metastases, and glioblastomas, and are committed to moving forward with clinical trials to support our data-driven approach. To establish a benchmark for re-irradiation harms, we recently performed a meta-analysis with modern-day studies of same-site brain re-irradiation with brachytherapy. We found mean symptomatic radiation necrosis rates of up to 23%. Our rates with gametil are lower, both from the trial and commercially, less than 10%. Furthermore, we found in the literature in our meta-analysis reported rates of radiation necrosis requiring re-operation of up to 12%. With Gametel, we know of no cases of reoperation for radiation necrosis in over 200 pre commercial and commercial patients to date. Early adopting institutions are beginning to publish also. At the 2019 SNOW meeting, the University of Minnesota team presented their experience with the first six recurrent high grade glioma patients who were receiving resection in Gametel, highlighting ease of use, excellent dosimetric coverage and low radiation exposure rates. The University of Minnesota team has gone on now to perform over 20 cases since that time. At the 2020 SNOW meeting, the Memorial Sloan Kettering team presented their early experience of the first 15 recurrent previously irradiated brain metastases resected and treated with gametil. They looked at something we didn't think of. They graphed radiation exposure to staff, family, and caregivers relative to regulatory limits. 
you can see how little the radiation dose is to the staff and family in these bars below. Each of these is an individual patient. We have done 108 pre-commercial cases over that number now commercially, and every patient has been under that required by radiation safety guidelines. So they're only in the hospital for surgical care, no helmet or extra protection necessary. Several review articles have also touted the advantages of the gamma tile system. The University of Minnesota Neurosurgery and Radiation Oncology team recently published a review in Future Oncology describing the advantages of the gamma tile system. The highlights are summarized here on this slide. I won't go over them in detail due to time considerations. Just to say it is a well-written, informative article and available open access on the journal's website. They also report the clinical experience using gamma tele for recurrent glioblastomas is favorable with an excellent safety profile despite these patients having been heavily pretreated. A neuro-oncology publication in Current Oncology Reports earlier this year reviewed the advantage of gamma tile also, including the access to care advantage for patients who have limited access to radiation centers or other compliance concerns. Finally, a number of prospective trials using gamma tile are being launched this quarter. The first of these was presented at the SNOW Brain Metastases meeting this year, a multi-institutional randomized control trial run by MD Anderson looking at resection plus SRS versus resection plus gamma tile for a large previously untreated metastatic brain tumor. Dr. Brockman will dive into this and other upcoming gamma tile clinical trials now. Thank you. I'm gonna pass it over, Ashley. Thank you, Dr. Choi. Very okay. compelling information. It, that, that was great. I hadn't seen all of it myself. Hey, um, can you guys see San Francisco again? Is that what shows up on the screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. So I'm trying to minimize my little bar on the left to maximize the size for everybody. Um, okay, planned clinical trials. So uh, we, we do not need to do them for FDA clearance. We, we've got that, but we all, um, our, our company motto is improving the lives of patients with brain tumors, and we actually really, really mean it. And we know we need to find out where this best fits um, for patients and families and, and centers. So we have a few things up our sleeve, one of which is to sort of redo with a much larger cohort the um, real world use that the BNI trial uh, started on. So we're targeting 600 uh, enrollees. It's going to be a consortium style, um, rather like uh, the lessons, the positive lessons we've all learned from um, uh, the Gamma Knife and Cyber Knife users, which is uh, kind of let individual centers uh, collaborate, but we're supporting the, this at any uh, using center after uh, three to five initial cases. I believe it's uh, th completely through the IRB and ready to go in one center, uh, meaning no other obstacles. And, and at IRB, we're using a, a Western IRB, at IRB and five others. So we really do expect enrollment um, this month. Um, we expect the major disease sites to be uh, high-grade gliomas, meningiomas, and mats. They can be reoccurrent or de novo, and there can be the rare tumors, which I'm really hoping we get a few of so the centers can collaborate on, you know, how did it work for the, for the 17 dural sarcomas we could find in the next year, that sort of thing. Um, the uh, outcomes will be overall survival, local control, um, functional status, and then uh, QOL and NeuroCOG at selected sites. Another center that is uh, practically open is gonna be run by MD Anderson. Uh, they did the last two uh, randomized control trials, both the Mahasian and the Brown um, uh, trials and are very interested in this. We're gonna have similar entry criteria to the Alliance trial. Um, the flow is shown here. We're gonna randomize, uh, enroll and randomize before surgery. So we can capture the, capture the surgical harms um, on each side as well. And it'll be for patients with one to four tumors uh, two and a half to five centimeters. One will be the index lesion. It is coming out. The others are um, presumably smaller, no greater than four centimeters, and they will receive uh, randomized to surgery and tile placement or surgery and SRS or FSRT um, according to size on this side. So there will be no super low SRS doses. Um, we really are uh, following the pattern of, of the Alliance trial because we know that if we do it right, we'll be compared to that and people will wanna know. We're uh, about 200 enrollees, um, multiple or solitary. 
uh, as you would expect, and people are going to get SRS to the remaining lesions in the GT arm and SRS to all lesions in uh, or FSRT in the surgery arm on this side. And then an MRI here um, to make sure that it was a solitary lesion to be fair to patients and everyone else. And if they do have a new lesion that pops up within the first uh, three or four weeks after surgery, they're going to cross over to the SRS arm on that side, but not SRS to the cavity. This is a standalone treatment. If I didn't say it before and if Mihi didn't say it, um, the results we're showing you are uh, standalone therapies without additional local treatment um, on our trials so far. Uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering is initiating a single site trial and reoccurrent. The last one, the MSK was, uh, pardon me, the uh, MD Anderson was for de novo, a new disease. This is reoccurrence. Uh, they currently do not irradiate at reoccurrence after resection. They watch. So they have two arms. Um, one is resection and tile placement, and the other is resection and current local standard of care. Um, they're a busy center. They've done 20 uh, something uh, tile cases this year alone. Uh, they find it very useful in the COVID era, and um, they expect to uh, complete their trial within a couple of years. Um, we also have, um, of course, interest in gliomas. Uh, gliomas uh, worked long in my career in glioma therapy, as a lot of you guys have. Uh, it's tricky. Um, you're setting yourself up for, um, you know, there's only so many levers you can pull when you're talking about higher dose radiation. Uh, we can't really say that's been done in the in the post temozolomide era very well or very you know uh, consistently, um, but we do want to explore both upfront and reoccurrent glioma trials. Um, we have a couple of ideas. Again, time is short, but uh, we are um, working with uh, thought leaders uh, to help develop these. Make sure we have the right uh, um, uh, cohorts in place. Uh, one of the uh, ideas uh, out there right now for a, a glioma upfront version would be to do the uh, resection and gamma tile placement, um, wait just for surgical clearance, meaning 10 days or so for wound check, uh, start temozolomide, and then um, actually this is the wrong slide. I apologize, my computer crashed and I did weird things all night with it. Uh, it would just be really 20 uh, fractions or so EBRT over four weeks. Um, the idea would be to black out the site of uh, high dose radiation from the uh, uh, gamma tile and start the temozolomide earlier, but not shortchange patients and then go on to standard strip. And then we're also looking at a concept of uh, a TTF uh, before resection, um, tile placement and resection, and then, and then TTF afterwards uh, in the reoccurrent setting, um, as well as the possibility of uh, looking at um, Sorry, my computer is doing still funny things again. Uh, subbing the TTF out here for basically uh, um, Avastin, as we showed you, the data is pretty strong there. Um, going to uh, call that done, and Ashley, turn back over to you for questions. Thank you, Dr. Brockman. Um, so again, if anyone has questions, please submit them using the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. We've already gotten a few in, so I'll get started with those. Um, what is the role of the radiation oncologist in the procedure? Um, this is multidisciplinary, rather like an SRS program, and uh, the radiation oncologist, this is a live radiation device. They, it is, is I'll say, your license um, uh, for this. It's not on neurosurgery or anybody else, so you're the prescriber. And so it's preoperative evaluation for uh, adequacy of, of uh, case, you know, is it a good case or not? Um, they're typically, but not always in the operating room. Um, and uh, they're either handing or, or, you know, manipulating the tiles for the neurosurgeon. And then they have the post-operative functions of, of patient care, uh, planning and the like. So um, that's, it's, it's as you would expect. Thank you. Um, what is the process of bringing gamma tile into our practice or our facility? Um, it is, uh, that's, that's a longer question than, than a short answer, but simply enough, um, first things first is to make sure that there's, uh, or in parallel, I should say, that you have a, a radioactive materials license that uh, supports cesium um, or is uh, able to support cesium, and then the others are business. There's no capital cost to this upfront. There is a contracting 
um, uh, issue. Uh, there always is. It's a hospital, you know, uh, uh, in entry product. So we kind of work through with our people we call our regional sales directors. So any any of that beyond that, I think, is um, something we've done nearly 25 times, and we have about 30 or 40 other centers just behind those. So we can we can help out. It's not Thanks. bad, but it's painful in COVID. Nobody wants to do anything new. Yeah, it could take a little time, but um, the, the radioactive materials license is the, the first step, definitely. Um, so what is the impact to my Gamma Knife Center to divert those cases? Well, that's a great question because the thing that we normally, and, and I don't have lots and lots of uh, good pictures in my deck about this, but the thing that we normally talk about doing is looking at cases that you were just plain going to turn away. Um, cases that were too big or too previously irradiated, our uh, BNI data uh, set the average number of uh, the average number of prior courses in radiation for the previously irradiated was two, and it went up to five. We we capped it at ten thousand rads prior to the same site. Um, subsequent to that, I, I think you pick and choose. This is really not for everybody. We're we're not trying to uh, get in a match with. Um, uh, people with, a, you know, a, an active um, uh, glioma program. Uh, this is, uh, or, or METS, for example, this was a glioma. You wouldn't have done that practically with anything. It was an interhemispheric craniotomy, not even a gross total resection, previously irradiated. Um, uh, but but start, with, start with the cases you were going to turn away and then see if you even like it. That's what I would say. Thank you. And we have a uh, kind of related question. So please present your cost effectiveness data compared to EBRT and SRS as a salvage therapy or for an initial therapy. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, there, it doesn't exist for tiles. They're new. Um, and as whoever asked the question probably knows, I don't think that data exists in the other literature. Um, for any of these things, um, partly because uh, payers are such a mix a across the uh, spectrum. What we do know is that uh, with rare, rare pockets, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and maybe Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, payer mixes are positive across the board. Um, but we have been working for about two years now with a group from uh, the London School of Economics um, on a uh, program of um, cost effectiveness, and it is uh, more than I ever wanted to know and will be built into the um, METs and other trials uh, because you have to figure out not just cost, but life earned or life continued to be lived, which is a tricky subject. So happy to have that conversation, but I don't think that data actually exists any place for anything. Thank you. Other than, other than sorry, nephrology and... Um, uh, a dialysis, frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I know that data. Okay, great. Um, we have a question. What if we do not have radiation oncology on site? How does the procedure work? Um, it, it depends what on site means, but uh, uh, many centers, uh, radiation oncologists are, you know, in a community. They, if they have hospital privileges, they come to the hospital as they would for some other thing and, and you know, build this into a portion of their day. Um, and uh, in those centers, what we've utilized is the nuclear medicine department for kind of the receipt as there is what's called the hot lab. Um, and, and they function for that. Uh, the, the, sh the tape I showed you, the brain met from um, Mountain View Hospital in uh, California, El Camino Hospital in Mountain View, California is, is exactly that setup. So we, we've worked through that a bunch of times. Thank you. Um, we got the question, at my institution, we have patients fly in for their craniotomies and then fly home a couple weeks later. Can patients with gamma tile fly on a commercial aircraft? Yes, that's a very, that's a very good question and a very good use. Um, uh, Mihi, I think, pointed out, and I didn't do it all that well, is that every case now, and we're, we're over 200 something for them, at the end of the craniotomy, when the bone flap goes back on or the, the cranial repair, even just bone paste, um, the patient's dose in the room has been such that they can be discharged to home uh, in the general public. This is a piece of bone. Um, the lid goes back on here, the cranium, and uh, everybody's been under six millirems an hour. Um, so they are actually able to fly. As you, People who fly in and out for the craniotomies uh, for tumors are probably at the... Uh, um, 
uh, receiving center for a week or so, just usual and customary until the wound is cleared. And by then we're one half life down. So they're, you know, well under um, uh, the limit at that point. Yes, they can, they can go home if they're, if they're cleared to fly for any other reason by the neurosurgeon. Okay, great, thank you. So gamma is a great option for patients with access to care issues, both in the United States and internationally, it sounds. Yeah, there's there is as you know again there's onco tourism in the United States, um, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, uh, Miami, uh, UCSF, all for those reasons are are adopting. Great. Um, we got a question about using Gamatel for brain meds. So for multiple brain meds, assuming you treat the index lesion with Gamatel, how do you treat the other smaller tumors? Um, yeah, so uh, as, as however your local, um, uh, your local custom would be, uh, this is not a good case. Um, that is not what you want to do. Um, however, uh, in somebody with a, you know, a not a need for whole brain radiation, if you have a single lesion um, that has to come out, and that's often how this happens, and a few others, uh, they can be used, you know, stereotaxy can be used. Um, many cases these days, if there's an, uh, a, a targeted mutation in the tumor itself, um, melanoma, uh, all positive lung, some even breast cancers, um, and they're small enough and not symptomatic, people are withholding additional uh, focused or whole brain radiation in favor of starting the systemic therapies. And um, uh, either of those are, you know, those are, those are local and complicated decisions, but uh, our medical and neuro-oncology colleagues are sophisticated people, but you, you don't necessarily have to do anything else. But in our trial, um, the upfront trial of, uh, you know, one to four lesions, the other three are getting stereotaxy. Okay, great. Well, um, that actually concludes all of our questions. So thank you again, Dr. Brockman and Dr. Choi for this really thoughtful presentation. And thank you to all who attended today. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to us at customer service at gtmedtech.com and we're happy to either schedule a follow-up call with you or answer your questions via email. So thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>